The Sovereignty of God, Part 2. A uh, little review and definitions. The definition, that I read it last week, is supreme in power, possessing supreme dominion as a sovereign ruler of the universe, superior to all others, chief. God is the sovereign good of all who love and obey him, supremely efficacious, superior to all others, predominant, effectual as sovereign remedy. I like that. He's effectual. He knows what he's doing, and he's like a surgeon that's precise. Supreme, pertaining to the first magistrate of a nation, a sovereign authority. The supreme lord or ruler, one who possesses the highest authority without control. No one can control God or manipulate God. Some earthly princes, kings, and emperors are sovereigns of their domains, and only their domains, and only while they are alive. Um, I did the review of uh, last week of the, the river. It's going to go down no matter what the canoe does. You are the canoe, or a nation is a canoe. You can row upstream for a while and get tired, but eventually you're going to either tip over or you're going to turn and go downstream. You can uh, flip yourself over, you can make yourself go left, or you can add some good works to your journey and paddle faster. Maybe you paddle this way, canoe. This is a kayak. <laughs> paddle faster to get down to where you want and get some rewards when you get to heaven. But when you're dying gone, the river's still going to keep going. God's sovereign will is going to keep moving no matter what you do. They had an old quote that said, um, hey, if you didn't answer the call of God to go plant that church somewhere else, then, you know, God, someone someone, someone else would. And I said, well, maybe he would, maybe, maybe he wouldn't. Well, if God really wanted something there, then he would challenge the next guy and the next guy and the next guy. Okay? He's sovereign. His will will get done and does get done all through history, even through men's rebellions, even through the rebellion times in your life. He still got through to you and the rebe rebellions of the nation. Psalm 57, 1 through 4. And a lot of times people get confused on sovereignty toward his saints versus sovereignty toward sinners. That, that's a big difference. Something you have to think about. This scripture is sovereignty toward David, his saint. Okay, versus sovereignty toward the sinner. Okay, uh, he'll reprobate that sinner. He's not reprobating that saint. Uh, smack that animal for me. Show that you're the sovereign. Be merciful unto me, O God, and be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. A, a cry is not a wimpy prayer. This is a deep prayer from the depths of your heart that you're crying out to God that you need an answer, you need a direction, you need a baby, you need a healing, you need a breakthrough, you need a salvation of somebody. You're crying unto God. That's how David was in this spot when he was boxed in. But we should have that attitude even when we're prosperous and not boxed in. Uh, the uh, preacher said once, uh, uh, how you street preach hard and contend, that's how you should pray. They say you should be in your prayer closet the way you are on the streets too. I said, amen. That's a good quote. Too bad he backslid, but that was a good quote. Unto God that performeth all things for me. Yes, he's performing things for you. And a lot of times it comes through suffering and persecution to bring a maturity, to, to bring a more well-rounded picture of God and his sovereignty and his holiness. And, um, and David was chased by King Saul. For quite some time. He did not get deliverance right away. For quite some time he was slandered and mistreated even after he killed Goliath. Even after Samuel anointed him as king. He was chased by God and God was using that. And uh, David knew this. He wrote this. God that performeth all things for me. And it's not just for David. It's for you. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him. That would swallow me up, Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. Yeah, mine too. And I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Now, we're not going to go through all of it. We read it last week. That's just kind of a review. 
And so we hit the big picture of God's sovereignty last week. The big picture of he's, he's large and in charge. He kills kings. He raises kings up. He turns dictators. He causes some to kill others. He raised Jesus from the dead, raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus didn't exercise any faith. Martha and Mary didn't exercise any faith. Jesus just raised him from the dead. Okay? Uh, think, think about that. Elizabeth had John in her womb. She did not exercise faith to get filled with the Holy Ghost. As soon as she heard the salutation of Mary, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Sovereign move of God. So, yeah, I'm all, I, you know, I'm a faith preacher. I'm like, hey, I'm going to lay hands on you, pray for healing. You believe too. Absolutely. You believe too. You know, pray for you to receive the Holy Ghost. You, you speak it out. I'm all for that, but I'm not going to say it's all you or it's all me, the preacher. Elizabeth never asked. She got filled with the Holy Ghost. Understand that. Nebuchadnezzar never asked for his brain to get snapped. His brain got snapped. Paul never asked to get knocked down on the road to Damascus. He got knocked down. God's a sovereign God. Sovereign over man. Period. End of story. Sovereign over you. More than just killing kings. They sovereignly heal, heal people too. Sometimes they ask, sometimes they don't. He's sovereign. So today though, I'm going to hit on two different sides, totally separate subjects. So it's almost like two sermons. We're going to talk about sovereign civil king. He's the civil king, theonomy. And we're going to talk pretty deep about God's influence in salvation. God's influence in salvation. So Jesus as the civil king. Uh, let's go to 1 Timothy 6.15. Which... In his times he shall shew, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. The only potentate, the only sovereign. So he's saying not just over Nero or Roman emperors, but also over the jungle of the Amazon and that chieftain and his tribe, and the jungle in Africa and that chieftain and that tribe, and Aborigine in Australia and that chieftain and that tribe, that Jesus Christ is the only potentate, sovereign of all those sovereign little rulers, and he's the king of all the kings, and he's the lord of all the lords, Jesus Christ is king. Now this is in contrast to the government thinking that it is a sovereign. The government absolutely thinks that it is sovereign. Sovereignty, all-powerful, infallible. Think about the word infallible. Can't make a mistake. Humans are fallible. I make mistakes, you make mistakes. A mistake is not a sin. A sin is a mistake. We're fallible. God is not. He's infallible. So the government tries to be all-powerful and infallible. I, I gave James a, a story uh, the other day, I don't know if he's right or not yet, about the persecution uh, from the IRS toward Wesley Snipes. And so... But when they, uh, he had a bad accountant, and his accountant did file his tax stuff wrong, and he did uh, owe millions, and it looked bad. But the government took this black man to one of the most racially charged areas in all of America, in Florida, where they literally have, like, parties for white supremacists. And that is where the federal court decided to try so they could get the jury pool of all whites. That's a wicked federal government. He had a really good lawyer, and I found the lawyer through free speech lawyers, and that's how I connected, and he's like showing his cases, and I'm like, oh, look, he did the Wesley guy. I mean, I'm reading it, and I'm like, oh my gosh, these guys are wicked. Five felonies, tw facing 20 years, th this and that, going up against the government, going up against an all-white jury, uh, messing up jury selection, this, that. I mean, it's a good thing the guy had a good lawyer. He'd be in jail still today if he didn't. But the two missed, so he, the, bottom story, the bottom part is, ah, the moral of the story is all the felonies were dropped, but not the misdemeanors. He served two and a half years in jail because he just couldn't get those misdemeanors out. And each misdemeanor is a maximum of a year. So somehow it came out to two and a half years. Maybe it was three misdemeanors and he got six months. So two and a half years he served. But the government said they're infallible. They would not admit to wrongdoing on the felonies when clearly the felonies were wrongdoing. And the jury acquitted him and said, this guy didn't do anything wrong of a felony. All 12 jurors, who were probably even prejudiced, it was such a clear case that they're like, no, he didn't do a felony on like six counts. Not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. But did they admit the wrong? No. Rittenhouse shoots a pedophile Antifa punk. The jury says he's not guilty. 
Does the government say, hey, I'm sorry, here's an extra hundred grand for your time? No. No, they never pay any thanks for when they, when, I think every time a guy, under this jury system, not theonomy, because the court cases will be done in like two hours, but in this system, every time they're found not guilty, the government should pay them for all the lost work that they missed. They only like 20 grand there. Okay? <laughs> I mean, all the time you missed work, you get paid for that. But no, they say they're infallible. They say they're infallible because governments try to be sovereign. They're pretend sovereigns. All seen, all knowing, you want to track your cell phones, basically trying to be a copycat of go. And the government fails every time. They fail by being either too loose, hyper grace, false mercy, loose on these murderers, loose on these pedophiles, or too harsh. You know, so the guy jaywalked too much, the guy did a little thing on his tax form, throw him in jail for two and a half years. So they always are too loose or too harsh. Just like a father or a, quote, pastor who's not saved, he will be too loose or he will be too harsh. I guarantee it. Every parent I meet and know, I just think to myself, are they too harsh or are they too loose? And normally it's a combo. They're going to be too harsh in some things and too loose in other things. What are you? Definition on the kingship side. Sovereign means the monopoly of power and law. That's what it means. Okay, a monopoly means you have no competition. No one's allowed to be a comp competitor. So if you are a sovereign, you have a monopoly on the power and on the law. That's why we know Europe is being taken over by Islam, because they are granting those Islam ghettos their own law courts. Mm -hmm. Saying, you know what, it's your culture, you judge them in your law, We'll back that up, except for like maybe like a murder. If they murdered their own kid, they might get involved in that. But all these other ones, disputes about inheritances and that, that's your culture. You do it. So they've tolerated it to the point to where those two whole law systems going. And, and it, was, it was, they stole it from God. But Islam stole that from Jesus. Because in Corinthians, Paul says, you Christians should have your own law courts. And through history, in the early Roman Empire, the Christian law court was so good that Constantine was like, we need some honest people. Look at how they're running things. Our heathen citizens are going to them for justice rather than our own Roman courts. That's how good the courts were. Okay? They would, when they bring them in, though, they say our verdict is going to be final and binding or you're kicked out from the Christian law courts. You won't be able to come back ever. Like, no, I'll take it. You know, here's the, here's the dispute and the two businessmen would agree and whatever, and they, they'd go by the verdicts because they would get justice. Well, in Roman law, they wouldn't. And so Muslims stole that from us. All right, so the definition of on, on civil side of sovereign, monopoly of law and power. These two are inseparable. Power and law are inseparable. Your law defines your power, and your power backs up your law. Mm -hmm. So you have a simple example. You have a law toward your daughter, and it has to be done this way, and if not, then they're going to get in trouble. You, you, they're inseparable. You cannot have true law without power. That's just opinion. And you cannot have power without law. It's just some raw warlord power. There's no definition to it. There's no statute. There's no priest. There's no defining that together. Okay, so that's the sovereignty of the state. But Jesus said in Matthew 28, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. And then he said to disciple the nations. We are to disciple the nations. So we are to teach the nations, and me, I'm American, to the American nation, uh, where the law system is wrong and against God. Abortion is evil, it's murder, and the abortionist should be executed according to the law of God. Okay? We are to teach the nations and disciple the nations uh, in that, which brings an automatic conflict. That would be like another father coming into your house and saying, now you're doing it wrong this way, James, you need to do it that way. Jesus set it up on purpose so it would be an automatic conflict. He's a theonomist. He always has been, always will be. And he says, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. When he rose from the dead, he said, now it's given to you. And over time, as their bad fruit is shown, as good fruit of Christianity is shown, we got laws changed. We, we, Christians got rid of widow burning in India. The husband dies, burn you. I die, burn you. That's what India did for like 4,000, 5,000 years, okay, for a long time, okay? They always say Hinduism is the oldest religion, you know, compared to, you know, Christianity. It has been around longer than uh, the resurrection. Yes, I give them that. But Christianity has been around since Adam and Eve. 
that Abel was a prophet. He's a Christian. And we are, we're the oldest religion, so they're just lying again. Don't fall for any of their lies. When you hear something, it just sounds off. You may not be able to articulate why, just know that it's a lie. Hinduism is second oldest religion. Probably tied with Baalism. <laughs> okay, that's the type of it anyway. <laughs> that's not on my notes. So, it's a, God set it up so it's an automatic conflict. He says, you are go to disciple the nations. Doesn't just mean individuals. They preach to kings. You know, they've always preached it. Christian missionaries have always ended up getting invited to preach to the chieftain or someone else over time, just like I've been able to move to different courts. And my current New York case, if we lose, we will appeal to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court probably will take it. Because they're like, what? That's free speech. Like, how could that New York judge miss it? That federal judge. Federal judge. So it's like, yeah, they just they just keep moving up. So all these missionaries in Burma and this place, they end up getting up to the top because somebody else said, well, what do we do with this? It's a preacher. I don't think he's breaking the law, but I'm not sure. Because riots are starting. Things are happening. Like Paul before the magistrates and Acts. God set it up so it's an automatic conflict on purpose. On purpose. To challenge sovereignties to show that he's the greater sovereign through his church. And so when the lesser party thinks that it's the greater party, that is laughable. Imagine an eight-year-old peasant boy back in medieval times thinking he can whoop a knight on a horse with a battle axe and a sword. Imagine an eight-year-old American boy with a slingshot thinking he can take on an army man with an M16. But the guy with the slingshot still shoots the sling. It, they still shoot the sling. The, the U.S. government is... Crazy Muslim one, this crazy Hindu, they still fight. They still say, oh, no, no, I'll break those bonds. Oh, no, no, we'll, we'll hand join in hand and, we, you know, it's going to prosper. And God puts them in derision every single time. They're still trying to exercise their sovereignship, sovereignty, even though king after king and president after president dies. Even if it's a little country of only 10,000 people. I Googled the other day, smallest country in the world, uh, who's... Um, recognized by United Nations. I know there's other ones. And it's a little island in the Pacific with 10,000 people. And they have their own little laws and their things and blah, blah, blah. And so that's interesting. They still want to be their own, their own little sovereign, have their little thing, even if it's 10 people. They're always going to fight against God's law because that's in their heart. That's why after Cromwell was gone, why England fell, because it was in the heart of the people to still be heathen. They're like, no, no, we'd rather have a king over us than God's law. We'd rather have 300 death penalties and 34. That's how many were in back in England back then. God always wins. It's only a question of how long until he wins. And how uh, far apostate will the churches of that nation go? How far apostate will it come? Some will go all the way until they're fully snuffed out and there's not one real church left in that nation. That, yeah, there, there's many nations on this country today right now. I don't think even have one church. I know Iran has underground churches and other ones have underground churches, but I mean, North Korea does. But there's probably a few countries in Europe that literally have no churches. Zero. UK. Okay? So how far an apostasy will happen and how long until God will finally uh, judge them. And, and because of man's rebellion, God gives them the government they deserve. Make sure you understand that. Because of man's rebellion, God gives them the government they deserve. They deserve it. Don't we preach homos deserve AIDS? Don't we preach you deserve hell? Then I say America deserves Joe Biden. Yeah. America deserves that curse of Biden. China deserves the curse of Mao when back when he was ruled. The Puritan England deserved the blessing of Oliver Cromwell because they turned to righteousness. The American Revolution deserved to win because King George was wicked. They didn't deserve what came after that, though. I go, I guess they did, because, uh, you know, not enough of them stood up against Ben Franklin and the Freemasons. So I guess they did deserve the Constitution. We just killed us slower. Therefore, God is still sovereign over these rebellious governments. When he lets them get the bad ruler, it proves that he's still sovereign over those bad governments. He kills the kings and the presidents, and he raises up King Saul's, and he raises up King David's. And so God is sovereign over every square inch of the earth, every little bug, and every member of the Trump family. He's still sovereign over every one of them. And God is sovereign over every second of every time, every minute of every day, every hour of every day, every day of every year, every second of every time he's still sovereign. He lets you breathe another second. 
He lets them breathe another second. He sustains all things by the word of his power. So, when God got tired of Gandhi, he let an assassin kill him. When God got tired of that dictator, Abraham Lincoln, he let an assassin kill him. When God got tired of Gaddafi, he let the American government kill him. When God got tired of JFK and Martin Luther King Jr., he let the CIA kill them. And guess what? Later, God killed all those CIA agents that were part of that conspiracy. And just a few months ago, I praise God for this, uh, Henry Kissinger uh, died. And so he's in hell now. He was one of those conspiracy guys. Old Jew. <laughs> old Nixon advisor. Old guy from even JFK. Way back. If you don't understand God's sovereignty over kings and presidents, then you're going to think that that man is in control or, or that the devil's in control. Well, somebody's in control. So it's like, well, if it's not God's in control, then the devil must be in control. Or maybe, maybe man really is autonomous and really in, in, is in control. If, if you don't understand that God is in control. So he lets these kings be in control for a time period because uh, he's sovereign. So much of the raw power that you see government, uh, how, and the reason you, that you would, people would think that, because of visually seeing the raw power governments exercise over people. I mean, we think it's kind of bad in America, some persecution, some things happened in the last few months. Well, you know, in Norway, they just take your kids. In Greece, they just take your kids. Is that going to homeschool? What? Homeschool? Nah, you need to put them in the government indoctrination camp. We'll just take them away. They say, we're, we're sovereign over you, period. And they have, the, they have a, these, uh, these uh, thugs with the badges and boots and batons. They call them cops. And so these thugs will come under their law and say, we're going to take them away. So it sure would appear as if man is in control until he lets Islam rule over Greece as a judgment. Islam rule over Norway is a judgment, maybe 50 years, 100 years. So they deserve rape. They, they deserve rape from the Muslims. The, rape, the Muslims will rape them. That, that will happen. <laughs> okay. I said it early in the other video, but that's why Gandhi got assassinated. After Pakistan and India became different countries, he was way too soft on Muslims, and he treated them his same strategy the way he did the English. So turn the other cheek, be a pacifist. Yeah, that'll work on English British men. It won't work on Muslims. They're getting raped and destroyed left and right, and whole cities on that whole border were all mad and fed up and all that, and hard... Hardline Hindus, probably just regular Hindus, finally had enough of it and assassinated him. And then they got that border fixed and they, you know, they, they, they became a secular nation, but they're pretty Hindu. That's better than a Muslim nation. I'm not for the Hindus, don't get me wrong. But, and they do kill and they're wicked to Christians, but Islam's 10 times worse. And so uh, they would have deserved it though if they stayed pacifists. You know? mm -hmm. And so God didn't stop the bullet. God didn't stop John Wilkes' bullet. God didn't, God didn't stop those things. He's sovereign. He's sovereign. Okay? Ehud uh, uh, worked. Ehud uh, was successful. A Bonhoeffer wasn't. He's sovereign. Okay? So if you, if you didn't realize that, you would really think man's in control because of the raw power you see them exercise. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't saved, but God called him a servant, and God used Nebuchadnezzar to judge the wicked Jews. But that's not the end of the story. And... Later, God destroyed the Babylonians for breaking his law. So if Islam take over here from Greece, Norway, eventually something will take them out. He used the Catholics to destroy and push back Islam's 50 to 70% of their territory. All out of Spain, all of Bain, all of North Africa, just pushed them all the way back. All the way out of Jerusalem. Just use Catholics to just whoop them and destroy them. Yeah, I've had enough of that. But never forget, later God destroyed the Babylonians. So someday, when God uses another evil nation to judge America, this doesn't mean it's a stamp of approval upon China or Russia. It doesn't mean that. It just means he's using them to judge America for being wicked, and later in time, he'll judge them too. My prayer is it's at the same time, like the end of the sixth vial, and then all the mountains are smashed on the seventh vial, that it's all at the same time. But church, it could be 10-year gap. It could be 5-year gap. It could be 20-year gap. Either way, you just need to live for the Lord. He who endures till the end, the same shall be saved. Now, the next scripture proves what I just said about God giving evil, evil rulers over rebellious people. And this scripture is why I started this series. This scripture will blow you away. It's kind of like seven years ago when I really understood it for the first time with the scripture. Is God sent a lion spirit to Ahab in order to get him killed. I was like, wow, that's deep. Let me read it again. I was like, wow, he sent a lying spirit to Ahab to get him killed. When I read this in Ezekiel, 
I was like, I got to preach on the sovereignty of God. Ezekiel chapter 20. God is sovereign over Biden. God is sovereign over these wicked rulers. I'm still praying that he dies on public TV at the perfect timing. While he's in office is my prayer in the name of Jesus. But if it's afterwards, that will be a funeral I'll preach. Just like we preach, preached uh, Jimmy Carter's wife's funeral. That was fun. My first funeral preach on purpose. Uh, did accidental one once. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 11. A little bit of context before we get to the, the scripture that blew me away. And I gave them my statutes and shewed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Moreover, also, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. And my Sabbaths they greatly polluted. Then I said, I would pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. Now jump down to verse 23. This is where it's coming in here. I lifted up my hand unto them also in the wilderness, that I would scatter them among the heathen and disperse them through the countries. You there, girls? Chapter 20, verse 24. Okay. Because they had not executed my judgments, uh, but had despised my statutes and had polluted my Sabbaths, and their eyes were after their father's idols. Here it is, 25. Wherefore I gave them also statutes that were not good. God said, I gave them statutes, laws that were not good through these evil civil rulers. Meaning he let those evil civil rulers enact those wicked laws. It's in your Bible. It's right there. I gave them also statutes that were not good. And judgments whereby they should not live. Oh, pastor, I don't believe it. We'll go to 26. I polluted them in their own gifts. And that they caused to pass through the fire all that openeth the womb. That's abortion. That I might make them desolate. Here's why. I let them go worse so I can make them desolate like I did to Pharaoh. It's all in Romans 9. That I may make them desolate to the end that they might know that I am the Lord. That's heavy. God lets these old, evil rulers be here. And God gives these evil statutes through these evil rulers. And it's in your Bible. Because America was filled with whores and whoremongers in the 50s and 60s, God let Roe vs. Wade pass, which kills the babies right here, right now. So what? So he can judge America with 120 million dead Americans later. Because 60 million babies have been killed. And in Revelation, he says, I'm going to pour out double for the blood that they've shed. And the land cannot be cleansed from blood, but by blood, by the blood of man. So that's 120 million. And the longer we track it up, the higher the death count will be. If we reach 100 million dead babies in 15 years, it'll be 200 dead million Americans, or God's a liar. Or God needs to repent to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's not going to repent to Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, I gave them the statutes. Did he cause that evil? No, he let it happen. I've done the analogy 100 times. It's raining outside. You got an umbrella. You're in the local church, you're living holy, you're protected, you're good, the rain's not hitting you. You're an idiot and you walk outside, you're getting hit with the rain. The rain's there either way. God's there either way. God's sovereign either way. He says, oh, you caused my head to get rained upon. No, you rebelled and you moved outside of the umbrella. So, yeah, he caused them to have those statutes. Right there. I gave them statutes that were not good. Now, yeah, let's get one more sovereignty one. It's kind of... A little different, but go back to Ezekiel 11.5. I just, just a little side, a little side rabbit trail on, on sovereignty of God. Last week we gave quite a few scriptures of him, uh, him answering a prayer before you even pray the prayer, and him knowing these things. 11.5, and the spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord, thus have ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. Every one of them. Omniscient. He knows everything that comes in your mind. So be honest with God in your prayer time and in your regular conversation. In your regular conversation in your mind. 
So God is sovereign over the governments of America, and God is sovereign over all the governments of the world. And sovereignty is manifested in law and power. And God shows that he has the power over their power. And our duty, this is important, our duty, which depends upon your calling, when you live under Babylon, our duty is to be like Daniel, Elijah, Obadiah, Joseph, or even a combination of them. Elijah, rebuking king's preaching. Obadiah, doing what Obadiah did. Read that. Daniel worked for the wicked guy, but he rose up and enacted God's law. Joseph worked for the wicked guy, but he enacted God's laws. So depending on the calling there, this is for the men, then you have a duty to do this because God's still a God of dominion and moving forward, not of cowardice and backing off. And so in Hebrews, it says that through faith, they subdued kingdoms. So we are still be on the offense. It's just different ways to do the offense. All right. Now my second sermon within the sermon. The last part, I want to go deeper on the sovereignty, on the depth of God's influence in salvation, about salvation. You're going to see a lot of scriptures today. I have given the short version a hundred times. It goes like this. Salvation is not fully from God. Man has a part. And it's not fully done by man. God has a part in salvation. But I'm going to go a little deeper today. Uh, both the Calvinists and the hyper-Arminians are wrong. Calvinists say it's all God, and the hyper-Arminians say it's all man. And, and, and most of them are wrong about the reprobate doctrine, which I'm not really teaching on here. Uh, we have hammered for uh, seven and a half years, you must repent, you must repent. We have hammered the repent side a whole lot, and now we all want to study the God side. I want to show you the sovereignty of God on his side of this, John chapter 3. The foundation is not man, the foundation is God. His holiness is the foundation. His righteousness is the foundation of how a holy God can have a relationship with a sinful man. So now that you understand God's holiness reflected by his law, then think about man's unholiness. What does the scripture say about the unregenerate man? And we know they're not born sinners, but when they choose to sin at whatever age, and they start heading that path, they're going to fit the descriptions that I'm going to read to you in the next four or five verses. This is the unsaved man. John 3, 19 and 20. And this is the condemnation that light has come to the world, and men love darkness rather than light. The unregenerate man loves darkness. Loves darkness. Doesn't like darkness. Doesn't put up with He loves darkness. He loves it rather than light. Because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Doeth evil. Eight-year-olds can do evil and 28-year-olds can do evil. He hateth the light. He loves darkness and he hates the light. That's the unsaved guy. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So all left to himself, with no divine influence, he does not come to the light. John chapter 6, verse 44. And you, I, I want you all to write these down, and you children write these ones down too, and you read some of these ones later, and you meditate upon these, because you've got the repentance down, you must repent. Put it on man's side, but I want to make sure you put it on God's side. You understand God's side a lot too. John 6, 44. Uh, uh, yeah, I said 44, and then we're going to go up to the next one. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. 64. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. So God decides who to turn reprobate. And he does turn some people reprobate. But he still needs to divinely influence the people toward godly sorrow which leads to godly repentance. Let's go to Acts chapter 13, 48. Paul and Barnabas were preaching here. Uh, 
Uh, did I say 40? 40. Yeah, 48. Uh, I, I like that. Let's go back to 46. 46 to 48. Uh, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of God, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. God knows the future. He knows who's going to say yes. He knows who's going to say no. He knows who he's going to convict. He knows who's going to backslide. He knows who he's going to reprobate because he's sovereign. 16.14. Acts 16.14. The conversion of Lydia. And she was preached to. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Tyratira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. There it is. That she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. The Lord opened her heart. The Lord opened your heart to his love, to his grace, to his power. You still had to repent and do your part. But he did his part and opened your heart and brought that conviction. Romans chapter 3 verse 10. Now we do tease the Baptists about this because they like to apply this to the saints. But we're talking about what is the status of the unregenerate? What is the status of the sinner? We know from John 3 that they hate the light. We know from John 3 they do not come to the light. Very clear teaching on famous John chapter 3. Romans 3, 10 to 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seek after God. You know what? They don't seek God. But the preaching triggers them to start seeking God. Cornelius was preached to. He didn't arrive at that by himself. Then he started seeking God. Job was preached to. Seth was preached to. Abel was preached to. And they started to seek God. But initially, no. No, they'd want to try it their own way. There is none that seek after God. They are all, underline it, all gone out of the way. All of them. All of them have sinned at some point. All like sheep have gone astray. Gone out of the way. Your kid must be born again. No one's born a Christian. Your kid must be born again of his own free volition. And I think it needs to happen before age eight. Because there was a wicked king that went to hell who started being evil at age eight. Second Chronicles 34. They are all gone out of the way and baptized at that age too. If they're old enough to pick what they want for dessert, they're old enough to understand these other things. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Now, I'm not saying they're going to understand everything about the revelation of the holiness of God and the law of God at age eight, but I'm saying they should know. I'm a sinner. God is good. I'd be punished for being a sinner. I'm sorry, God. Save me. Okay, you know, the, 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 the soft heart. We know what a soft heart is. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Go to 620. Talking about the sovereign God. Talking about his influence and salvation. We know they hate God. They don't come to God. And there's none that serve God and seek for God. And they're all gone astray. Now 620 says, For when we were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. So unregenerates are servants of sin. Slaves of sin. Period. They are a slave to sin, they're a servant of sin, and they're, quote, free from righteousness. Now, they're going to hell, they're not free from the judgment, but they're, they're, the, some, they're not feeling much conviction. Uh, when I was a wicked sinner, probably 90% of the time did not convict me. Things did not convict me. Some things I was like, oh, yeah, I was convicted. I remember I blasphemed the Lord once in high school and, and, and shook my fist up in the living room, and I was by myself, and, you know, and I literally, the fear of God hit me, and I was like, ah, whoa. I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to do that ever again. And I didn't, I didn't do it ever again. I, as far as like, like on purpose, I'm sure I'm accidentally dumb drunk or something, but on purpose like that, I, it was the weirdest thing. I was like, whoa. I was like, yeah, I don't ever do that again. I was like, I'm not doing that again. And other certain other sins, but most of the time I wasn't convicted. 
You know, you probably weren't convicted on a lot of stuff you did and some of the stuff you were, depending on what it was. Eight, seven. We don't go by your experience, though. Go by the Word of God. The Word of God says that they're all sheep gone astray. They love the darkness. They hate the light. What's the Word of God saying? Eight, seven. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Enmity means hatred. The carnal mind of the sinner is hatred against God. That's not subject to the law of God. It can't, it can't walk in the law of God. It cannot live holy. The goat in this church can't live holy. That's why they can never make it. It can't. Neither indeed can be. Not possible. It's impossible. That would be like asking you to go to the nightclub and be a sinner. But not just for two hours, but for 12 months. It's not possible. So, same way there. The calmly minded is enmity against God. It is not subject law. Neither indeed can be. It's not possible. So God must convict them first in order for them to repent. This is why we preach. Titus 1, don't go there, says in due times God manifests his word through preaching. So God must convict them for them to repent. This happens because of preaching. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Can you persuade a reprobate to repent? No. But others you could. The problem with the Calvinists, they call every unsaved person a reprobate. That's wrong. And the problem with the Arminians, for the most part, don't think there's any reprobates. They think they can all be saved. Now, God has a divine sovereign influence in salvation because we just read four or five scriptures that says they hate the light, they don't come to the light, their sheep gone astray, and their mind is enmity against God. Who wants to make peace with someone you're an enemy with? God has to hit them somehow. God has to hit that hard. They don't want to make peace. My mom doesn't want to make peace with God who's going to demand some things from her. Your mom doesn't want to make peace. Well, your dad, your mom, they don't want to make peace. They're enmity with God. You think, God, you, think that, you think the Lord of the universe, created by our earth, is going gonna, is gonna to say, okay, okay, here, here's, the, here's the treaty. Let's, let's have a little treaty and a sit down. No, he's going to do like MacArthur did when Japan wanted to surrender and said, here's the terms of surrender. The Japanese literally brought terms of surrender. MacArthur, tra do that trash out of you. He told the ambassador, you tell him it's one that's unconditional or we're going to bomb you tomorrow. Another atom bomb. Go tell your emperor it's unconditional. Oh, we're going to bomb you tomorrow. And he meant it. And he already had orders from the president. Because FDR loved to kill Japs. He just loved it because he's a wicked guy. Okay? I don't call him Japs. I call him Japanese. Okay? I like the Japanese. I love Panda Express. Okay? So, what did he do? <laughs> I'm not racist. What did he do? I just hate Japanese culture. I don't like eating cats, you know? That was it. That's the Chinese. Hey, whatever. They tease us whiteies, you know? They always get us Irish and English mixed up, but we don't get all mad, you know? Why, well, you Norwegians are Vikings and you Germans are Nazis. Like, come on, it's the past, man. Okay, or, you know? Like, they, they do that all the time. Like, Mexicans are mad, they're called Spanish. They don't even Spanish are mad, they're called Mexicans. Notice the whites don't care. We're above it all. We're above that. We're like, we don't care. We, that doesn't matter to us. You know, they get them all confused all the time. So, the Japanese emperor fully surrendered. He fully surrendered. These people are enmity against God. Our family members, they don't come to light. They're enmity against God. Understand, in your prayer life, God must move or nothing happens. God must move. We're going to preach to them. Don't get me wrong. We're going to get that. But, and then when they're convicted, then they have to repent. And also, God is the one that quickens the fear of the Lord in sinners. Go to Jeremiah 32. God quickens the fear of the Lord in sinners. Jeremiah 32 38 to 40. I'm sure there are some white people to get really offended if, the, if some Irish guy, don't call me English, and some Norwegians like, don't call me German, you know. Uh, but this white guy doesn't care. Nope, I don't care. Just don't call me French. Uh, I guess I do care. <laughs> They're a bunch of effeminates. 30, 32, 38. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God, 
and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. So the fear of the Lord brings good to you. The fear of the Lord brings good to your children. In verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them, but I will not turn away from them to do them good. But I will put my fear in their hearts. God did it, not man. God said, I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. See, if you ignore the God's side, which is required in salvation, you have fallen into the trap of humanism. If you ignore this God side, you have fallen into the trap of humanism. Let's go a couple more. We're almost done. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Did I say 1 Timothy? I think I meant to say 2 Timothy. Yeah, 2 Timothy 1.9. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Wow. Wow. Kind of like Ephesians 2.10, that you would walk in the works that were ordained for you before time began, before you were saved, that he had this plan. Because he's the author and the finisher of your faith. Okay? But you, still have to, you still have to stay on the molding. You, you, the paper still has to stay there. If I'm writing the sermon, it, it can't run off. You have to stay on the potter's wheel. You stay, in the, stay in the will of the Lord, abiding in Christ. Okay? You do have a choice. We're against once saved, always saved. You, you can be like Demas and leave the Lord. Okay, but he's going to convict you on the way out. 2.25, 2 Timothy 2.25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them, underline that, give them, give them, repentance, to the acknowledgement of the truth. You've heard me say it a hundred times. Repentance is a gift. Repentance is a gift. It can be withdrawn. You become a reprobate. And he's saying here that God would give the fear of the Lord. God would give grace. God would give light. God would do the convicting. If God peradventure would give them repentance. To the acknowledging of the truth. It's a gift. The fact you were able to repent was a gift from God. Some aren't given this gift because they're reprobates. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Go back just a couple books. If you haven't real fully realized yet that God is a major part of the salvation of people, then all I can do is give you a few more scriptures because I think I already laid it out pretty clear just from John 3 alone that these people hate the light and they do not come to the light. So God has to convict them and draw them, which he does. His Holy Spirit is working everywhere at all times doing that. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning, God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, and belief of the truth. <coughs> so, I'm, we're, we're so against women talking, I don't even let my wife say bless you during the service. Amen. Women should be silent in the church saying, yeah, that's right, mommy, no, she just smiles like that. Yeah. Because it, it starts off with a blessing and it becomes a whole mini sermon right there. It just keeps going and going. <laughs> yeah. So God hath chosen you from the beginning. Uh, go back to John chapter 1, last scripture. The most God-centered gospel. Book of John, last one written of them all. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, that's your part, when he convicts, you need to receive you need to repent and receive. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, 
even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood. It's, it's not inherited. Just because your daddy's a preacher and a pastor doesn't mean you're automatically saved. Talking to you two. Doesn't mean you're automatically saved, okay? But you need to cry out to Jesus from your heart, your little heart, and say, Lord, save me. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If he doesn't convict, no one gets saved. Now, he's a just God, so he's never going to withdraw the conviction except from people he's reprobated. So the little kid steals a little toy from the little neighbor. They're not reprobates, okay? All right? Now, a little kid rapes their neighbor. Yeah, that's a reprobate, okay? <laughs> Rapists are reprobates. Homos and heterosexuals, both, are reprobates. And um, so nothing happens unless God moves. And this is why we pray, Lord, open their hearts. We're going to preach, but Lord, open their hearts. And we are dealing with a reprobate generation like Jeremiah. So don't get discouraged. Not too many people get saved. It's the same message for 2,000 years. We're preaching what the historical apostolic church has preached. We're preaching like the preachers in the 1940s and 50s. I've listened to old sermons. I'm like, amen. That's what I preach, you know? And uh, 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 it's Jeremiah's time. Not too many people got saved. It's, a, it's, it's before judgment toward a reprobate generation. But we are praying that God opens their hearts. And why we see conviction, uh, once we see, once we see conviction on a sinner, that's why we urge them to repent. We say, hey, today's the day of salvation. You know, call on Jesus, verbally, call on Jesus right now. When we see that conviction on them, we urge them to repent and get saved right then and there. God has free will and God is sovereign and nothing moves unless God moves. And we need to keep praying for God to move. And you know this quote uh, if God is not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. Well, let's put in the word sovereignty there because Lord and sovereign are pretty much interchangeable. If God is not sovereign of all, then God is not sovereign at all. Someone else is. And the Bible says he is. And it definitely ties into salvation too. Amen. Every head bowed. Everyone praying. Lord,